was my biggest fan. She clapped the loudest. <laughs> and I do appreciate those little one-minute testimonies. I learn something new every time. Like, I didn't know April was a punk rocker. Yeah, I know. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's kind of cool. Yeah, I want to. I need to see pictures. I want to see pictures of that. Um, well, I am just really honored to be here and very, very encouraged to be able to be sharing with you. Um, and I don't know about you, but for me, the Women's Day this year was really moving and refreshing, almost in an unexpected way that just m met a need in me to, I'm not even really sure if I can fully articulate it, but I just felt like it was very refreshing and needed and special to me. And these, the series that we've been doing on being whole in mind and in body tonight, and then in two weeks in spirit with um, Kelly, um, is just, I feel like, even meeting more needs. So last, or the, I want to say last week, but it was really two weeks ago, I was so encouraged to learn about my brain, and I've been pushing my button on my palm. I'm like, okay, red, blue. <laughs> and that really works. Just that extra little calm without reacting, and um, I'm just learning so much. So maybe tonight will be the night that you learn something new or God moves in your heart. And if not, then I'm absolutely certain it'll be the next one that we have. But I really do believe that God has something tucked into this series. Very, very special message for each and every one of us. And it's going to look different for each one of us. Um, I really, truly believe that. Um, I know that he wants to impact your heart. And he wants to get you and me unstuck. He wants us to break through and break down the roadblocks that stop us from the progress of drawing closer to him. That's his ultimate goal. Um, so if you would just take a moment and bow your head and pray with me, I would appreciate it. Father, thank you so very, very much, God, for just who you are your initiation with us, your desire to have a relationship with us, your provision for that relationship, God, and that you give us your word and that we can learn about you and we can learn about ourselves. And um, it sounds really old when Danielle was, was um, sharing that I've been your daughter for 35 years. I'm thinking, man, that's a lifetime. That's like far more than most of the people in this room. And yet, God, I feel in so many ways that I'm just starting to scratch the surface of the treasure that is in my relationship with you, and I'm just so grateful for it. I really do pray tonight, God, that your, that your message comes through, what you want us to hear, what you want us to learn. Soften our hearts, open up our minds, help us just to put distractions and burdens and the heaviness of heart that we can feel. Help us just to put that over on the shelf for the time being and just to have a little bit of time to refresh and focus in on you and our relationship with you, God. Thank you so much for this time during the week. I love you, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, um, whole in body. I have a band-aid on my thumb, so that's going to be hard. Let's see how this works. Okay, there you go. Yay, it works. So, we learned about the mind. Tonight, we're learning about the body. Then, we're going to be learning about the spirit. And for, before I became a Christian, I think this is what my life looked like. These three areas were very separate, not integrated, isolated, not really working together very well. And, wouldn't it, and God, of course, wants these areas to integrate into a whole so that we can be whole, and it would be, just be so nice if it would just nicely start going together like this. But it just doesn't work that way. At least not in my life. Okay, so here's me. I'm probably more spirit and mind connected, and then the body's been sort of disconnected, not really understanding how to have, how to think about it spiritually. And then at other times, maybe the mind and the body was barely touching. That's when I was struggling right there. And then, um, and then sometimes the spirit actually is not not very big. <laughs> in me. I mean, it's there, but other things are taking over at different times in my life. And there's the body still not connected. But I don't even think this is accurate because my whole relationship with my body has been pretty much a hot mess. And it's looked more like that. <laughs> just kind of sparking and farther away and prickly and just not able to pull it in, try as I might. So 
this is where God wants to take us. And I'm sure when we get to heaven, that's probably what it's going to look like for us. Um, but we can't get there with our own doing. Like, we really need God's power in a, in a powerful, powerful way. Um, so it's really quite remarkable that I was asked to do this lesson. I don't claim to be an expert in the body in any, any way. I'm not a nurse, as some of you are. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a physical trainer. I'm far from it. Um, truth be told, I'm a woman who has really significantly struggled my entire adult life with body image, my weight, and my relationship with food. In fact, you know, you saw that my body circle was all not a circle at all. That's really kind of how I saw it. Um, and so that was my intention stone when we did yoga at the Women's Day. And I pulled the open stone. And I wanted to show it to you because I love it. It's sitting on my kitchen right by my sink, and I look at it every morning. And I, it's a reminder to me tonight to be very, just to be open with you, open with what I've struggled with, and open with what God is teaching me and what he's showing me, and open with what his word says to us. Maybe even some of the things that are a little bit harder to swallow. So my story is, has been pretty up and down. Um, if I were to pick a movie to describe my story, I would probably pick, well, there's two. The never-ending story, <laughs> and then Groundhog's Day. <laughs> Put those two together, <laughs> and that would be my life and my relationship with my body. Um, and, you know, maybe you can relate to this um, deeply. Maybe you can relate to it a little bit. Hopefully, you're healthier in your mind and in your heart than I have been in this area of my life. Um, but I have spent the majority of my adult life gaining and losing the same 25 pounds over and over and over again, never, really never coming close to the 50 or so that needed to be lost. And this struggle drove me, um, drove me to seek out weight loss groups, to buy books, join gyms, etc. And it really has been, for many, many years, an idolatrous obsession in my life. And in one of my Weight Watcher stints years ago, um, and I think I've had four of those, <laughs> uh, they said, tomorrow or next week is Diet Roundup Day. Write down all the diets you've ever been on. I'm like, OK. So I did, and I had 35 separate attempts to lose weight, identifiable. And this was 20 years ago. So there's been a lot more even since then. Um, I'm talking the Herbalife diet. Anybody remember that one? Hilton Head diet. I did Tybo. Anybody do Tybo? I did Curves. I, did, I joined Curves. I did the Way Down Workshop two different times. I bought Body for Life. That was a book. Maker's Diet. Daniel Diet. I did FA, which is a 12-step program for food. Um, I did whatever diet Oprah was on at the moment. And then I probably did her whatever ex exercise regimen she chose to was happen to be doing. So following her, because I feel like I could relate to her. Here's a woman on the screen that America really respects, and she struggles with her weight just like I do. And I've watched her and followed her and cried with her and felt for her all these years. And one of the things that I actually did was Jane Fonda. Okay, so if you're giggling, that means you're in the club. <laughs> that means you're 50 plus. You're with me and her. Okay, so Jane Fonda, this was in the 80s. I had that hairstyle. She was 50 years old when she made that video. 50. She looks amazing. Okay, so you probably wonder what she looks like now, right? That's her now. 81 years old. Isn't she awesome? She's killing that dress. She looks so good. She's, she does admit to having a little bit of work done. Um, but still, that's more than just work. That's a lifetime of really being dedicated and taking her health very seriously. Um, so, but we're bombarded. You know, she had work done, sends a message that we're supposed to look a certain way, we're supposed to match up a certain way to whatever the style or the images of the moment, and um, 
the work is never really done, and Hollywood just bombards us again and again and again with beauty, or what, how Hollywood identifies beauty. Of course, God says it's the inner beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That's what is of great worth to him and to each other. So no wonder I struggled. I mean, I grew up in America just like you did, and the youngest of three girls constantly comparing myself to the people around me, my girlfriends, my sisters, my mother. Of course, I never stopped hearing about it from my mother because I was the chubby one. And that she, she was trying to love me, trying to help me, but it was really hurtful, some of the things that she would say, even though she didn't mean it to be in a hurtful or harmful way. So what does the Bible say about our bodies? Forget Hollywood, forget Jane Fonda, you know, forget all those gurus out there that tell us how to do it. You're guaranteed to lose the weight or you're guaranteed to do this or that. Um, we really have to look at what God is saying. And, of course, I didn't tell you about the healthier versions that kind of all that obsession and addiction evolved into healthier approaches like the paleo diet or um, detoxing and What's the latest detox? Which one are we doing this month? What's the hot one? Let me go buy it, and it's going to work. But deep down inside, I always knew it's not really going to work, but I couldn't not try. There was something in me that wouldn't, I, I had to do something because I knew something was wrong. I knew something was wrong with me. And I'm really, really grateful for the different programs that God led me to. And I do feel that three years ago, he led me to FA, which is a 12-step program for weight issues and for food issues. And that helped me tremendously. That's how I was able to lose my weight and keep it off three years later. So I'm very, very grateful. I've never been able to do that. That's the glory of God right there. So that's been um, very, very encouraging. But just to suffice it to say that... Um, there's been a lot of craziness, obsession, and food addiction in my life. But God is so merciful, and he works, he's been working very, very powerfully. So if you see some of yourself in my dysfunctional story, um, then amen, you're not alone. <laughs> um, and for others of you, as I said earlier, um, hopefully your, your perspective is a little healthier than, than mine is. So, but regardless of the differences in our story, God's word is super clear um, and speaks to each and every one of us. He's our creator, and he's a genius. He shares his insight with us, and he shares, and he gave us the, this gift of the body that you're sitting in right now. And it is an amazing gift from him. He gave you life for a reason. He breathed his life into your body. That's why we're sitting here today. That's why we're here. And he highly highly values your body. He highly values my body, far more than probably I will ever really fully understand. So your body and my body. Jeremiah 115 says, before I formed you in the womb, the color, I, the color on my computer at work looks a lot more contrasting. I tried to highlight some of the words. Um, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. So it says that God formed us with his hands, individually, uniquely, and then it says that we're consecrated. That means there's a reason why he formed us. He made you, and he set you apart for a very specific spiritual purpose. He has a plan for each one of us. Which that's why he formed this bo these bodies sitting out in front of me right here, right now. And he's got a divine purpose for us. Psalm 103, verse 3, New International Version says, I know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. It's he who made us. We're not an accident by design. And this, I think, is one of my favorite scriptures, Psalm 139. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. I know it full well. 
And then the second part of that verse, or that the next part, the next verse is, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was, was laid out before a single day had passed. So to back up, he knit us together. He knit me together in my mother's womb. And then verse 14 says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. NIV says, fearfully and wonderfully made. And I have struggled with that scripture for years because I felt like it just wasn't true in my case. I mean, I can read it. I believe God's word. I, knew, I know that God's word is true. And there I am reading it, but mm, just not feeling it. I didn't understand it. And when I read it in the, the New Living Translation, wonderfully complex, fearfully and wonderfully made. But I'm, and I'd look in the mirror and I would go, what? I don't feel fearfully and wonderfully complex and wonderfully made. I, I wasn't feeling it. It wasn't doing anything for me. Um, and yet, that's what the Bible says. This has been really, really hard for me to believe because I felt like, Something was very, very wrong with me. I was defective, which is what drove me to do all those things. I don't even know how much money I spent on all these crazy things. A lot of money. <laughs> um, but I really felt like I was defective. I wasn't wonderful. I was overweight, and try as I might, I was, it was impossible for me to do anything about it. I mean, I'm talking decades not just I gained a few pounds and I'm having a hard time dropping it. Year after year after year, change, moving into decade after decade. That's where I lived. I was so frustrated. I felt like an absolute failure. Um, I would pray in tears to God. I distinctly remember on my knees, in tears, there's tear stains on my journal, praying to God to change me and that he would hear me and answer me and then I would wait, and I would hear nothing. And this over and over and over again. I didn't get it. Because in other areas of my life, maybe we were going through a hard time in our marriage, and I'd get open about it, and I'd get on my knees, and I would pray about it, and I would see change, and I would see growth and progress. Or if there was a problem at my work or in my job or with a coworker in a relationship, and I would just get open about it, I'd get on my knees, I would pray about it, and I would see change, or my kids, or my friends. And I'd see God moving in all these other areas of my life, but when it came to food and my weight issue, it was crickets. I'm like, where are you? Where are you? Why did you make me like this? I don't understand. Is this some sort of sick joke? Like, that's really what I felt. And I actually had this conversation with God. Why don't you respond? This is, you did this to me. You need to fix it. This isn't fair. And I would look at other people, people who had no food issues, seemingly on the outside, had no issues with food at all. Thin people, food, they could take it or leave it. No addiction issues in that area whatsoever. And I'm like, gosh, it's just not fair. I wish I had... Their but they have it, but they have another struggle. We all have our struggle. I'm like, why can't I have theirs? Why do I have to have this one? Why are you silent when I'm asking you to change me? And then God gave me some insight. Have you ever had that happen when you're just meditating on a scripture and very subtly, very softly, you hear a little voice? And it's not audible. It's like in your heart and in your mind, and God speaks to you. But I think we have to get alone, and we have to get real, and we have to get honest and have these kinds of conversations in order to really hear what he has to say about them. It doesn't always fit in the neat little package that I wish it did. And there's not an answer out there for this problem, for me anyway. And so that's what I did. And I got really honest with God, and I said, why did you, I feel broken. I am defective. Like, there is a crack from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes, and I keep trying to fix it, and what do you want me to do? I've been a faithful disciple for all these years, nearly 30 years. At this time, it was 27 years. This was three years ago. 
I've been faithful to you. I've gone anywhere. I've given up everything. I've gone into the ministry. I've moved. I've adopted children. I've quit jobs. I've done everything that you've asked me to do. Why won't you do this one thing for me? And I keep trying to fix it, and it's still broken. I keep, it's like I'm putting little Band-Aids on a broken arm, and it's not changing. I don't get it. And I felt like I heard God when I finally got real and got through all the superficiality and got gut level real with him and had this prayer with him. He said, you think I don't know that you have a crack? Do you think I'm not aware of it? Do you really think that I'm not capable of changing it? I'm like, well, no, you are. You're, You're God. And he said, how do you think I plan on getting into your heart? If you don't have that crack, I can't get in. And I was like, whoa, I just started crying. And I realized that God made me wonderfully complex. The reason why he didn't answer those prayers, I'm talking 30 years worth, was because there was no prayer to answer. I was already fearfully and wonderfully made exactly the way I was. Nothing needed to change. And God made me wonderfully complex. I love that because that puts a positive spin. You know, because I think women get a bad rap. Like, women are just so complicated. (laughs) Relationships are so complicated, right? And um, God is saying, no, we're wonderfully complex. Like, it's actually a really good thing. Like, I like that. Um, There was nothing to improve upon. I was perfectly imperfect exactly the way I was for the glory of God. And I believe that now. And there's times when I kind of need to be reminded of that. But I, I'm really striving every day to try to live in that place. And the, the Bible also says that our body is a temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. This is so convicting. Okay, I remember, um, it's, first of all, it says that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. We don't belong to ourselves, and we must honor God with our bodies. Kind of sounds to me like we don't have an option. He made us perfectly exactly the way we are, and we really need to hear this. And you younger girls out there, you teens, you campus girls, I'm, I'm in a middle school and I'm bombarded with the transgender and the gender confusion. And I'm 54 years old, and it's around me in a middle school. I can't even imagine what it's like out there. And you need to remember, you're fearfully and wonderfully made, perfect, perfectly imperfect, exactly the way you are, and you are to honor God with your body. That's sexually, the way we dress, what we eat, how we exercise. We'll talk about some of these things in a minute. But I'm looking at this scripture I don't think we have a choice. I really believe this is God's will for us. I remember getting baptized on Thursday, on the 11th, as my spiritual birthday, as as Danielle was mentioning, I'm going to be 35. And my sins were forgiven. I said, Jesus is Lord. And I received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I remember going home that night, and my cheeks hurt because I was smiling so much. Okay, raise your hand if you were baptized in the last five months. Right there. Okay, here's our baby. So, how were your cheeks that night when you went to bed? Were they sore? Yes, because you're forgiven, and you're you're in God's family, and your sins are washed away, and you have hope for your future. You have hope for your children your marriage, your future marriage, your future children. And it's so amazing. And then you think, 
The Holy Spirit is in me? Wow. Okay, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. And that's, that's the power that raised Jesus from the dead right there. And so I've spent the last 35 years trying to wrap my head around that and trying to figure out how to make that come out and work in my life. Me getting off the throne, right? Like every day, humbling myself, get off the throne. You're not the Lord of your life. Jesus is the Lord of your life. Um, so, but I'm here to tell you, I still don't have it figured out. <laughs> but I'm learning and I'm growing. And so I'm really excited about that. So as I was studying about our body as a temple, as we've already established through the word of God, and God's words are true, so I started thinking about Solomon's temple. So I started reading about that and studying about that, which led me back to the tabernacle, which was a portable temple of, of sorts, a tent. I had a bunch of pictures and a whole bunch of tabernacle stuff, and I thought, i got to strike it because I don't have enough time to... That's a separate lesson. But... Um, Going back and reading about the tabernacle in Exodus chapters 25 through 40 is phenomenal. If you look at the detail, the gold threads, the red threads, the blue threads, and how they're supposed to use these threads in the fabric of the tent that's going to house the Ark of the Lord that has these huge gold cherubim on top of it, and then the mercy seat, that's what the top, the lid to the Ark of the Covenant, that's the mercy seat. We sing about it in one of our songs. I'm like, what's a mercy seat? I'm, is it like the front row, the front pew? <laughs> like, come forward and sit and like maybe get forgiven, you know? <laughs> um, but the mercy seat was the top of the Ark of the Covenant, solid, pure gold. Um, the tabernacle was marvelously complex, and it was temporary. It was just stuff. And God was very specific when he told Moses exactly how to build it. And it had to be portable because they were traveling for 40 years in the desert. They were just called out of Egypt. They were called out of slavery and bondage, kind of like how we're called out of our sinful lives, right? And now we're the temple, and they have this tabernacle, and they build it, and pretty incredible when they dedicated the tabernacle, it says that then the cloud, the cloud is the Lord, the presence of the Lord. The cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled over it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Can you imagine being there and witnessing that? Like Moses couldn't even go in because God was in it. I can't even imagine that. I'd love to, I wish they'd make a movie of that, right? That would be really, really cool. Um, and then we move on to Solomon's temple. And Solomon's temple was equally amazing in its splendor and its richness and gold and incredible detail, right down to the measurements of how things were supposed to be. And when they dedicated that temple, now this is more of a permanent, right? Bricks and mortar, it's more permanent. It's not just fabric that can tear and wear out. 1 Kings 8, 10 and 11. When the priests came out of the holy place, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the te temple of the Lord. Same thing happened again. When they dedicated the temple, God just came into it and occupied it, this beautiful, amazing building. And the priests, they're like, they couldn't even do their duties. They were given very specific things that they were supposed to do. They couldn't even do it because God was there. Pretty amazing. And guess what? It got cut off. You are God's priestess. My font didn't translate. It was cuter. But um, you are God's priestess because you're sitting right now in a temple. Your body is a temple. That means you're his priestess. So in 1 Corinthians 3, I mean, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, 
Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So you are God's priestess. You have duties within your temple. It's consecrated. It's set apart for a very special, holy, spiritual purpose. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You need to, we, we all, we need to honor God with our bodies, which that might even be my next, oh no, I thought it might have been my next verse. But we have this temple, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. The treasure is the Holy Spirit of God, Jesus dwelling in you, one with God. But it's in a jar of clay. And... But the reason for that is to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Thank God that he didn't answer those prayers of mine all those years. If I'd have been successful in any of those crazy other programs, and if they worked, then I don't know that his power would be showing in me. I wouldn't need him. The crack would be healed, the mortar would be filled up, it would all be all smoothed over and prettied, and um, I wouldn't need God. So we have this treasure in jars of clay. We're fragile. We're in, um, next verse. Oops, that's not the one. Um, but going on in that same passage, it says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Our bodies are fragile and desperately um, in need of our care. And if you think about it, um, how does this show? High blood pressure, cholesterol, migraines, heart disease, diabetes, anxiety, cancer, insomnia, sleep apnea, digestive issues, weight issues, overweight, underweight, food addictions, compulsive addictive eating, anorexia, bulimia, drug and alcohol addiction, depression, stress, inflammatory diseases, autoimmune diseases, birth defects, etc. I checked out seven of these are me of this list, seven, and... Some of them are controllable. Some of them aren't. Some of, some of them were born that way. If there's a birth defect and you're born with a weakness in your body, you're still perfectly and wonderfully complex with that weakness because God's going to use it for his glory. So looking at, um, not we could... Talking about the body and using the body as a temple, we could talk about sexual purity. We could talk about modesty. I'm not going to talk about those right now. I'm going to talk more about the actual physically caring for our own personal bodies, not how we're presenting it and what we're doing with it. Um, so the first area I'd like to talk about is our food. And 1 Corinthians 6, 12, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. And then Colossians 2.16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink. So God has given us freedom. In the Old Testament, there were all kinds of rules and regulations about what to eat, what not to eat, how to wash the dish, how not to wash the dish. There were so many food rules. And in the New Testament, Jesus declares all food clean. He says it goes into your body and out of your body. It's not the food. The problem isn't the food. The problem is the heart. And everything is permissible. We're free in Christ, but not everything is beneficial. Right? And there's a lot of, um, and, this, and this is let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink. So you could take that two ways. I could take it, like, make sure that my food and my drink is really good and holy and pure so that no one can point to it and look at me and judge me. Or I could take it as I'm not going to people please and worry about what people think. This is what God has shown me, and this is what I need to do, regardless of what other people think. And what God shows you might be different from what he shows me. 
And there's programs out there that are really good and healthy. They just may not be the one that God wants me in or the one that God wants you in. So we have to be very spiritual. So I'm not going to tell you what to eat or drink. I'm just going to say, seek God on that. 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or, what, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So the food that we eat and the beverages that we drink need to be for the glory of God. Does this, does this glorify God or does it glorify my desires in the moment? The next area I'd like to talk about is rest because food, rest, and then the last one's going to be exercise. That one's coming. Um, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. And I love this. This is Psalm 23. I love this where he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures because I don't always go to bed when I should. And I don't always, and sometimes I stay up too late reading a book or doing something else or doing a project. Or sometimes I'm a horrible insomniac. I wish I could get a good night's sleep, and I just can't, and it's so frustrating. And it says here that God wants us to lie down. He wants to restore us, and good sleep really does that. We need to sleep. We need to be careful that we're not so busy or distracted that we aren't allowing enough time for our bodies to to sleep and rest so that they can be refreshed and restored. Proverbs 3, 21 through 24. My child, hold on to your wisdom and insight. Never let them get away from you. They They will provide you with life, a pleasant and happy life. You can go safely on your way and never even stumble. You will not be afraid when you go to bed, and you will s- sleep soundly through the night. I'm like, okay, I want that. <laughs> sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But what I have found, um, insomnia, ever since puberty, insomnia has been an issue for me. I remember as a teenager being up for hours in the middle of the night. And what I've learned to do with that is if I can't go back to sleep within a reasonable amount of time, say 15, 20 minutes or so, I get up and I read my Bible and I pray. And I just figure God is like poking me. No, get up. Spend time with me. Come here. And I have the best quiet times at 2 in the morning. Now, I don't recommend planning that. I never plan it. But I don't recommend that. But I'm going, God, I get up and I, it's so quiet. The house is quiet. There's no distractions. And I really feel that I can be open with God and I can hear him talking to me. And, you know, my kids have all gotten up, you know, in the middle of the night to go use the bathroom and like, they see the light on and they'll walk. Oh, you're up? Yeah. Oh. And they're like, oh, mom's up again. You know, <laughs> there I am with the Bible in my lap and I have the best quiet times then. And then I go back to bed and I'll get maybe two hours of sleep. And I don't do the math anymore. I used to go, oh, no, what am I going to do? I'm only getting four hours of sleep. It's going to be a horrible day tomorrow. Well, if I think that way, it will be. But I think, you know what? God knows exactly what I need. He knows exactly what my body needs. And I get to rely on him. And then my prayer the next morning is, God, I feel weak. But when I'm weak, I am strong. And you're going to give me a great day. And he always answers that prayer. So I don't stress out about not sleeping soundly anymore. I used to. I used to really worry about that. Exercise. Isaiah 35, 3. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Get some exercise. Get moving. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified for the prize. Now, exercise is an interesting thing for me because I'm not great at it, and I don't love it, and I've resented it, and it's a chore. And, um, but guess what? God can change that too. And I really feel like he has. I joined a gym again, <laughs> um, one that's one of those deals. 
And I've been going regularly, and I really love it. I look forward to going. He's really changing my heart about it. I even had a situation where some young woman, literally less than half my age, cussed me out, cussed me out at the gym and threatened me, and then went out into the rest of the gym, and I went and told, and the, the worker saw it, and I was like, ooh, I don't want to change gyms. I felt afraid. I left the gym that day. I didn't want to go back the next day, and I felt like she could be waiting in the locker room for me, or, you know, what if I run into her and, the, you know, come out of the stall and there she is, you know, and I'm like, all these fears started going through my head because this girl, maybe 22, like this big, cussed me out and threatened me. And I'm like, she's a bully. I'm not going to let a bully control me. And I thought, I'll put on a baseball hat because I have the cute one Kelsey gave me that I still have. Put on my cute baseball hat and, you know, go a different time. I'm like, what are you doing? You're twice her age. This little girl is not going to keep you from the gym. And I realized it wasn't her at all. It was Satan trying to put fear in my heart, trying to derail me. I'm like, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Proverbs, I don't know why that's blue. That's weird. Proverbs 24, 5. A wise man is full of strength, and a man of knowledge enhances his might. So it's a wise man is strong, or a woman is strong, and a woman of knowledge is going to enhance her might. She's going to work out and get stronger physically. Because the older we get, we need it. Mm-hmm. I'm getting my Jane Fonda out, right? Go find my, my VHS. <laughs> okay, this one turned out a little bit dark in the, in the translation there. Could somebody look up Romans 12.1? Can we read it okay? And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. This is truly the way to worship. Can you guys see it on the computer back there? Can you say it really loud for us? This is how we worship him. Can you start from the beginning and read it from the beginning? So giving God our bodies a living and holy sacrifice is truly how he wants us to worship him. So I hope you... If you saw yourself in any of my crazy story, craziness here, um, you're not alone. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> you're my fellow sister. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a fellow struggler. I'm learning this each day. I'm learning new things every single day. If something did really move in your heart and you feel like God is speaking to you specifically tonight, uh, we do have a, a ministry we have a small group that meets once a week that we that um, deals which is which is a grace based approach to food issues, but it's really not about the food. It's really about our connection to God and His grace, which is the power to to make the changes that we need to make. And um, we're going to have um, Don and Peggy in the back with a clipboard. If you're interested, um, you can give us your name and number. We probably already have it somewhere in your email, but we'll, we'll make a group and we can let you know about that. We're going to be having an informational meeting next week on Tuesday evening at my house. If you're interested, talk to one of us or write your name down and we can let you know more about it. If you feel like, if you want to just come and check it out and, and if it's not for you, it's not for you. That's fine. It's not for everybody. But I want to make, I want to let you know that that is available if you feel that you need greater support in this area. So I really appreciate your attentiveness, and I saw some heads bobbing out there tonight. So hopefully um, you've been blessed by the scriptures and by the truth of God's word. And we are going to go to our discussion groups. Oh, where's my questions? I have questions. You'll have to write them down. Okay, the first one is, what touched your heart tonight? And the second one is, I'm trying to remember, word for word, 
Are you pulling them up? Um, the second one is, is your temple suffering from some deferred maintenance? If so, what area? And what's your next step? And then the third question is, does your temple need a complete restoration? If so, what would be your next step in that? So, oh, that's okay. That's the gist of the three questions. So if you jot those down, you can have some things to talk about. So thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my story with you tonight and some of the ways that God has really worked in my heart. Thank you.